last time we had um, just a few examples of, of limits, right? I want, I want to provide more examples of limits. Uh, we talked about uh, a terminal object being a limit, right? And a product, a product is a limit, right? So are there any other interesting uh, limits? Um, okay, so, so the, the next interesting limit is when you take the index category I to have two objects, let's call them one and two, and two morphisms. One going like this and one going like this. Okay, so these are two different morphisms connecting these two objects. And that's the whole category. It's a tiny, tiny category, right? Uh, so what does what does a cone look? So we have a category C here now, and the cone, so we will just, uh, the cone will, first of all, the basis of the cone will select uh, some objects A and B, right? Mapping one into A and two into B, and two morphisms. Let's call this morphism F, and let's call this morphism G. Okay? So that's the base of our cone. Now, the, uh, the apex of the cone, so some, some object C, right? So that's, that's what the functor D gives us, and this is what the functor delta C gives us, this object C, right? And to complete the cone, we need two projections because there are only two objects in the base, so there are only two projections, right? Let's call this P and Q. Now the commuting condition, right? The, the faces of this it's kind of squished uh, two triangles, really, right? Uh, so the, the commutation conditions are that this triangle has to commute. So P followed by F must be the same as Q, this triangle here, right? So F after P must be equal to Q. So that's one triangle, and there's the other triangle is, is G after P, must also be equal to Q, right? G after P must be also equal to Q. So there are two commutation conditions. Now we can eliminate one of them and say, okay, so Q is really given by F after P, right? So the, really the condition is that F after P must be the same as G after P, right? It sort of, sort of reminds you of monomorphism, right? Right. Um, <clears throat> and now, the, 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 so this is the pattern, right? This is the cone. Now, the best of these cones will be uh, the limiting cone, and the limit of, of, this, of this cone is called uh, an equalizer. So this is an equalizer. So, to understand what an equalizer does, uh, let's uh, consider what, what, what it would do for sets, right? So we have, we have this set uh, A, okay, and we have a set B. So now we are going to look inside sets and look, look at uh, elements of sets. It's, it's okay, right? So we have this function F, going from A to B, and we have a function G going from A to B, right? And we have this, this set C right? And we have a function P, this projection, right? So, what does P do? P will take this whole set C 
and embedded in A, right? So the image of C under P is a subset. So this is what P does, right? P creates this subset. And now we are saying, uh, if we follow P with G, or we follow P with F, we should get the same thing. But following uh, uh, one function with another function means that we are only looking at the action of this function F on the subset, on the image of this one, right? So F maps it into something, right? And G maps it into something. Right? And they have to be equal. Okay? So, so the equalizer, what, what it really does, it picks a subset of A on which these two functions are equal. So it's solving an equation, you know, that we have two functions, F and G. You know, for what values are these functions equal? Okay? So that's, that's a, a, a way of solving an equation. Except that it does it in, uh, in, um, in a category, right? So we don't, we can forget about sets, right? And now we have the equation in, in a much more general set. But I said this is sort of, this sort of looks like a monomorphism, right? Uh, is this really a uh, monomorphism? Um, so what happens here is, is that when, when, you, when you do universal construction, right? So, so this, this will be like the best possible C and the best possible P. So the best possible C and P will be the ones that pick a subset here that's exactly the right subset, right? It's, it's the Goldilocks principle. It's not too big, it's not too small, right? So it only includes these points on which F and G are equal, but it includes all of them, right? Because if there was another point here on which these two are equal and was not included there, then I could find a better candidate that, would, that I could insert between these two, right? This would be the candidate that has, that's like the same as C, plus it has one more object here, right? And if we would factorize, I would map this into this blob without this, and then follow it, right? So, so the best one has to include all of them. And also, when it maps this, this set C in, inside A, it better not squish points together, right? Because that would be uh, not, there would be like losing information if it squished points together. So really, it will, it will just map everything in parallel, right? Without squishing anything. So that's, on sets, it's called an injective function, right? Uh, in category theory, that's the monomorphism, right? So what I'm saying is that uh, this P must be a monomorphism, really. That's, that's, that's my intuition, right? Now, is that true? Right? So remember monomorphism? Monomorphism was something that if P is a monomorphism, that if I have some other set X, right? And, and there are two morphisms, M1 and M2, And if I follow them with P, right, if they give me the same result, so the composition M1 after P, uh, no, P after M1, sorry, right? So yeah, P, P after M1, right, equals P 
after M2. Right? Then M1 must be equal to M2 if this is a monomorphism, right? Let's do this as a, as a homework, okay? It is a monomorphism. It has to be a monomorphism, okay? So that's that's uh, that was um, the equalizer, okay? So the equalizer solves this equation f equals g. Right, finds you a, a, a subset that, and picking a subset in, in category theory, you know, that generalizes to just give me a, 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 a some other object and a morphism into it. That's picking a subset. That's like a generalization of picking a subset. Right. Okay. Next one. Uh, next one is called a pullback. Okay? So the index category now contains three objects. Okay, one, two, three. And two morphisms. Two morphisms going inside. This one and this one. Okay? So the pattern will contain, you know, object A, object B, and object C, two morphisms, right, let's call it F and G, and the cone will be some apex C and these projections, three projections, right, because now we have three objects and so we have three projections. So let's call this one P, this one Q, and this one we'll call R. Okay? So now the, the conditions, these, these two triangles have to commute. Right? So the commutation condition for these two triangles is F after P must be equal to R, right? And G after P must be equal to R. Uh, no, sorry, G after uh, G after Q. Right? Otherwise, it would be the, the equalizer. So here's the difference between this and the equalizer, right? F after P, but G is after Q. So these are two different ones, right? So again, we can eliminate R and just rewrite it as F after P equals G after Q. Okay? So this is a slightly more general equation that we had for the equalizer. Right? And uh, on set, what this means is, this is sort of, so, I mean, I can erase the R here because uh, we have eliminated it from the equation, right? Um, this looks uh, very much like a product, right? So if, if, if it weren't for this stuff, it would just be a product. So in sets, it's actually this object C would be uh, a set of pairs: one from P, one from A, one element from A, one element from C. Pairs, right? And this would be first, and this would be second. So it's like. Uh, the pullback is a set of pairs, first element of which, when it's pr projected with F, is equal to the second element projected with G, right? So G on first element is equal, F on first element is the same as G on the, acting on second element, okay? So that, that's, that's what the pullback is. And of course, we pick the best of these guys, right? The universal construction, uh, and which means that any other candidate will factorize uniquely through this, right? So if this is some p prime and q prime, 
right? Another comb like this. And there's a unique morphism that will embed this, let's say, C prime into C, right? Um, now, the intuition for this, um, okay, there, there, is, there is a nice intuition uh, that, that comes up in, uh, um, in, in a lot of mathematics. That, um, remember, a function is something that, that, that might squeeze elements together, right? So, in, in very special cases, a function is invertible, right? When, it, when it's an isomorphism, so it goes both ways, right? Then it doesn't squish elements together. But in general, it does. So, in general, a function is not invertible, right? Because the inverse of a function would, would then map one element into multiple elements, right? So, the clever thing that, that mathematicians do is say, okay, I cannot invert the function. However, I can define like a counter image of each point, right? It will be a set, right? So, if I have, if I have this function f, you know, it takes a bunch of elements and maps them into one element. So this is A, this is B, right? This is a bunch of elements in A that are mapped into the same element, right? They call this a fiber. So very often you will see constructions in mathematics go, okay, I can't invert this function, ah, but I can create a, a, a space of fibers, right? So I, I take all these fibers and, and, and say, okay, this is a set of fibers. And on a set of fibers, this function is invertible, right? So this is a construct, clever construction. So if you look at this picture, you know, F has a fiber here, right? For every element in B, you would get a fiber. So this is like the F inverse of some X. Is a fiber here. It's a set, right? Uh, and there is a fiber here, which is the inverse of G, G inverse of, of X, right? Another fiber. So it's multiple. And this guy here has like a Cartesian product of these two fibers, right? So these are all pairs here. The Cartesian product, it's like a little rectangle, right? So this is like a line, this is a line, this is a little rectangle. There are points there, the first component is this, second component is this. All of them will be mapped to X, right? If you go first component and F, second component and G, you'll get to the same X, okay? So this is, this is sort of like a vibration And, uh, and an example from, from uh, programming is uh, when, you, when you do um, uh, database programming, right? You, you can have a query from a database that's like select something from two tables, A and B, right? And you say where A dot X, for instance, equals B dot Y, okay? So you are selecting from, from, from these two tables, A and B elements, such that this guy is equal to this guy. Like if you have, you know, a, say a dating service, you know, and you have a, a, a table of uh, guys and a table of, of women, right, and you want to find all those couples who will enjoy the same food, let's say, right? So that they can go on a date to a restaurant. So that would be an example of a pullback. Okay. Oh, and one more thing about this, this pullback. 
Uh, it's sort of an exercise, to an exercise, right? What if uh, this set is a singleton set, right? And you see what happens if this is a singleton set? Right, so, so these two functions uh, uh, will map everything into a, si in, into a single element. So these, these triangles will automatically commute because this is like squishing everything into a single element. So what we get here is a product, right? So we'll get a product of A and B. Because this, the commutation of these, does not really add anything new, new no new information. But what if this is uh, if an, in an arbitrary category, if we pick a terminal object, right? A terminal object in set is a singleton, right? What if this is a terminal object in a category? Is that still a product, if it exists? Now how would we prove that? It actually is, right? The thing is, so, so if you are in an arbitrary category, then you have to think about you know, the commutation rule. So if this, this followed for this, that's, that's this arrow, right? And we're saying this arrow must be equal to this followed by this. OK, so this is this arrow, right? Now these two arrows, if this is a terminal object, must be equal. Right? Because for a terminal object, there's a unique morphism from any other object. It cannot be two. So this automatically commutes if this is a terminal object. OK. And now, for a bonus. So in category theory, as you know, when you order one dish, you get a second one free, right? It's called uh, duality, right? If you take a category and you reverse all the arrows, you get something uh, a dual to the previous one. So whatever, whatever construction we come up with in a category theory, we always get this other construction by just reversing the arrows. So <coughs> we have defined a, a limit. Right? If we reverse the arrows, we get a co-limit. So a co-limit, we would start also with an index category. Right? So we have some diagram in the index category. Right? We map it into some category C. And now instead of having projections coming from some apex, we will have injections going into an apex, okay? So we'll have some, some uh, object C and we'll have injections, right? So it's like upside, usually people draw it upside down, right? I mean, so that all the arrows always go down. Uh, so. So this is, uh, this is, sometimes people call it co-com, right? Because it's a dual to com. So you have these co-coms, right? And the best of these co-coms is such that, and here again we have to reverse arrows, right? So, so the best one is, is such, so this would be a co-limit, co-limit. Actually, co-limit is, is like lim d but with the arrow going this way. That, that's the notation that people use, right? So limit was lim with the arrow going to the left, something like this, and co-limit is with the notation. I can call it co-limit, right? Co-limit, D, where D is this factor, right? So we have the functor D, and just like previously, we have functor D, we have this delta C, 
right? So, so everything is the same, except that now we are going from D to delta C, rather than the other way around. And now, if we have another candidate C, right, then colimit is, is the one that has a unique morphism going from colimit to any other candidate. So there's a unique morphism M that goes from the colimit to another candidate. And of course, it has to factorize these triangles. So it's exactly the same thing. It's just like, but, but you just reverse the arrows, right? So you, we, we get the stuff for free. And of course, the, 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 the example, uh, the standard example, if you, if you remember, uh, a coproduct. Co-product was, you know, you had A and B, two injections, we called I and J, right? And this this was A plus B, right? The co-product, and was the best of these. So from a, from a co-product, you always had uh, a unique morphism to any other candidate that has two injections. Um, so, what else can we do with, with, uh, with co-limit? Uh, so, remember a limit uh, of an empty category, like if the index category is empty, that gave us the terminal object. So, in this case, if we do a co-limit from an empty category, we'll get an initial object, right? So, duality. I mean, if we do a dual thing, we'll get a dual thing since initial object is dual to terminal object um, then obviously it has to be the initial object right do i have to show this or this is like totally obvious totally obvious okay <laughs> so um, <clears throat> so the, we we had the equalizer then we'll have a co-equalizer defined in a very similar way, right? Uh, we had a pullback, uh, then the corresponding thing will be a push-out. So a push-out is, is you have three objects, right? A, B, and C, but this time you push them out. So you have two functions, F and G, right? Two amorphisms, F and G, and you form a co-con. So essentially, so what, what people people draw this diagram so that it's more more uh, it looks more like a like a diamond, right? So we put this here. This B, right? And this is the uh, this is the uh, push up. This is the best of. F and G, a push out of F and G will give you this object and two, per, two injections, I guess, I and J. So I'm, I'm not going to give examples of this because it turns out actually the examples for, for push outs are, are uh, not, not that <laughs> easy. I mean, they, they, they involve some mathematics that. And, and by the way, this diagram, this is called a span, this diagram. Sometimes, if, if, if you see uh, in the literature, this is called a span. And the other one is called a co-span. Okay, so, so this, this is as much as, as we need for, for uh, examples of limits and co-limits. Um, and I want to finish this part with an interesting thing that actually may be even interesting to us as programmers, and that's uh, that's the definition of continuity. <clears throat> so I don't know if you remember when, when we talked about functors, right? Um, functors sort of 
uh, look like continuous mappings in the sense that they don't break things, right? So a functor, if, if, if you have two objects that are connected with a morphism, a functor will not break this connection, right? It will map, a functor f will map this fa, no, this, this will be fb, and, and there will be a morphism here. This is f, there will be a morphism ff, right? I mean, it may squish things together. It, it may take these two points, two objects into one, right? Uh, it, it might take multiple morphisms into one morphism, but it will never break connections, right? So this is sort of like being continuous, right? Because continuity means you don't tear things apart, right? So if, if we remove this connection, that would be like tearing apart A from B. Not a good thing, right? So functors in this sense, but there is, there is a, uh, a, actually, you know, like if you, if you remember from calculus, what, what does it mean for a function to be continuous? It means that it preserves limits, right? So natural thing, say a functor is continuous if it preserves limits. So what does it mean that it preserves limits? So, First of all, we have some index category, right? And we have category C, and so we have some diagram here, right? And it's mapped into a diagram here, and then we have a cone, right? And this cone has commuting triangles here, right? Now imagine that we have a functor here from C to D. Right, some functor f. What will it do to a cone? Well, it will map it. Well, it will map this triangle here into some triangle here, right? It will map this apex into an apex. It will map these uh, projections to projections, right? It might squish the, these things, but it will never break them, right? So, a functor will take a cone and map it into a cone. So that's not a big deal, right? So, is every functor continuous then? Well, no, no. So, I, what, what I showed you is that a cone will be mapped into a cone. Now, a, a limit is a universal cone. So, if we have another cone here, that is a candidate, Right? Uh, it will be mapped into another cone as well, right? If there is a morphism N here <coughs> that maps this, factorizes this cone, it will be mapped into a morphism Fn here, right? How can we break this? And if this factorizes these triangles, it will factorize these triangles as well because a functor preserves composition, right? So all these, these triangles that were, that, that were commuting here will be commuting here, all of them, because composition is preserved, okay? So, does it mean that every functor is continuous? What can go wrong? Let's think about this. What can go wrong? Cones mapped into cones. These uh, morphisms are mapped into morphisms. Well, first of all, imagine that this is a bigger category, right? That this, this, this category is much bigger than this one, right? And in fact, it might have another cone that's even better than our cone, okay? It has a vertex outside of the uh, image of F, right? So there could be candidates that we haven't seen here. But there are other candidates here. So there might be better candidates. So there might be a better cone that will serve as a limit. So we might have a limit here that's better than this limit. So the, this is mapped into something 
but this cone is not a limiting cone. There is a better limiting cone. Right? So that's one possibility where it can break. Right? Another possibility is that uh, there might be more morphisms here, right? So here we had a unique morphism. That was the definition of the limiting cone, that this morphism has to be unique. What if we have more morphisms here? So right, this, this category could be bigger. It has more cones, it has more morphisms, right? So there is, there is a possibility of a functor not being continuous in the sense, right? So imposing continuity is actually a non-trivial uh, condition. <clears throat> and an example of a continuous functor that might be interesting for us is the home functor, okay? So the home functor is, uh, so actually there are two functors, right? There is, so, so we have uh, a home set from A to B, right? There is a mapping, one functor goes from A to CAB, and the other functor goes from, from B to CAB. Now we've seen this, these functors before, right? You know, this is a covariant functor, and this is a contravariant functor. This covariant functor, is, uh, in Haskell, it's called a reader. So this is like uh, data reader E A equals reader E A. Uh, right? So a function from E to A right, is uh, is a functor. It's a functor in A. It's parameterized by E. So the, the, in programming, this E was, was this kind of environment that we are passing along, and, and we are creating these reader uh, functors. It's actually a monad, right? Uh, and this one, uh, I, I think this one was called all. Oh. And this goes from A to E. Okay, so this is a contravariant factor in A because it maps morphisms in the opposite direction. I've shown you this before. Right. So first of all, reader uh, comes from the home functor and it's covariant. So since I said home, a home functor is continuous, it means it preserves limits, right? So example of a limit, simple example of a limit is uh, product. Product is a limit, okay? So it means that this, this functor, the reader functor, preserves product. What does it mean? It means that if if I replace A with some A comma B, right, then I should get two readers, right, after I map it. I should get two functions. And in fact, right, I mean, I, mean, I will, it's a combination of, Right, so this is a function that from E to a pair, right? So, so reader of, if I replace A with a pair, uh, the reader of a pair is a function from E to a pair. And this is equivalent to a pair of functions. One takes E to A and the other takes E to B, right? So this decomposition, that if I want to create a, if, if I want to define a function that returns a pair, 
I can as well define two functions that returns the first component and the second component of the pair. That's it, right? So this is not very interesting. What's interesting is this other one. Because now, what, what does continuity mean when the functor is contravariant, right? If the functor is contravariant, that the category from which it's, it's going is the opposite category. So it inverts stuff. So, like, if, if I have a cone in this category, it will map it into a co-cone, right? So, continuity for a contravariant functor means that it maps a co-limit into a limit, okay? So, again, an example, uh, co-product, right? So a function that takes, so now, now it takes something, right? A function that takes an either A or B. Okay? How is a function that takes an either of A and B implemented? Uh, well, it does case analysis, right? So it's really two functions, one from A and one from B. We get a pair of functions, okay? So we get a product. A co-product, the either, turns into a product of functions, right? That's what continuity means. Okay, let's take a break. <laughs>